Okay, so in this video, I'm going to introduce signal transduction pathways, and I'll use the examples of G protein linked receptors, receptor tyrosine kinases, and ligand gated ion channels. So when we talk about uh, signal transduction pathways and what their purpose is, now we want to think about the big picture of this topic is cell communication. So when one cell communicates with another cell, whether it's nearby or far away, they're gonna use chemical messages or chemical signals, also known as ligands. So these ligands have two different properties. We have our protein-based ligands and our lipid-based ligands. So regardless of the ligand, when it reaches its target cell, it's going to bring about a cellular response, right? There's a reason for the cells communicating. So when we talk about this video, we're going to be focusing on ligands that are protein-based attaching to receptors found within the cell membrane. So uh, in my last video, I used epinephrine, and I'm going to continue with that example here. So this epinephrine, though, is a chemical messenger, chemical signal, uh, but oftentimes it's called a ligand. A ligand is like a general name for a molecule that attaches to a larger molecule. Uh, okay, so when we look at this, so epinephrine, the ligand, will attach to a, a protein located within that membrane. So here, uh, this step is the signal reception. So the cell receives the signal, but then what? That's where the signal transduction pathways come into play. We gotta like relay or pass that message on, on the inside of the cell. So in this example, epinephrine is a protein-based ligand uh, attaching to the transmembrane protein receptor. Uh, but what about those lipid-based ligands, right? So let's just talk real quickly about lipid-based or steroid hormones before we spend the rest of the video on the protein-based uh, hormones. So the lipid-based or steroid hormones are going to have receptors within the cell, an intracellular protein receptor. So when we look at like testosterone, for example, it'll cross right through that lipid bilayer. Um, but when we talk about like the cell responses of a lipid-based or steroid hormone, most of the time it's going to uh, occur within the nucleus. So here we have our cell membrane. And then within the cell, you have the cytoplasm, but also the nuclear envelope. Now I put in red here on the side that this is not, this looks very similar to the intermembrane space in the mitochondria. That's not this. I'm ignoring all the other organelles and we're looking at the nuclear envelope that is also made of a lipid bilayer. So within the nucleus, we have DNA. And in that nucleus is the receptor protein for testosterone, for steroid-based hormones. And so here, testosterone, because it's also a lipid, can pass right through the cell membrane's lipid bilayer, as well as the nuclear envelope and it will attach the receptor protein on the inside. Now, what will happen is together, that is now an active like protein that will work as what we call a transcription factor to activate gene expression. So gene expression is a whole nother subject on its own, so I won't go into detail about transcription factors here, but generally speaking, when we talk about steroid hormones, their receptor protein is located within the nucleus and its function is to activate or turn on gene expression. Okay, so let's go back to protein-based hormones though. Now, because a protein-based hormone cannot cross that lipid bilayer by simple diffusion, it's going to be received by a transmembrane receptor protein. And when I say transmembrane, that means it spans the membrane. It goes through and it's like a membrane protein. So we can talk about this membrane receptor in a couple different like um, categories, I guess, uh, or regions. Regions is a better word. So the part of the receptor protein that is outside of the cell is called the extracellular domain. So the region or the domain outside of the cell is extracellular domain. So sometimes you'll see like uh, word problems or essay prompts uh, talking about maybe mutations in the extracellular domain. 
Well, that would be a mutation kind of in that, um, like almost like an active site, like in that little groove right there. Um, so that's the extracellular domain. Then you have the intracellular domain. So the part of the receptor protein that is intracellular or within the cell. So it's touching the cytoplasm. But then we have a whole region that is actually like embedded within that lipid bilayer. So that transmembrane region, you can imagine that because proteins are made out of amino acids and amino acids can be polar or nonpolar, you would expect that that region of the protein within those fatty acid tails area would be made of nonpolar amino acids. And the amino acids you find in the extracellular and intracellular domains would be polar amino acids. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about though, this is the general structure and layout, uh, the three different domains or three different regions in a uh, membrane protein. Uh, but here there are actually three different kinds of receptor proteins that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about G protein linked receptors, receptor tyrosine kinases, and the ligand gated ion channels. So let's go ahead and start with a G protein linked receptor. So in this, uh, here you have a, um, a, a group of like protein subunits. So if you remember protein synthesis, how you have multiple polypeptides join to make a larger protein. Uh, you also notice, so if I go back here, you notice that those little red tail things are some lipids coming off to kind of help that peripheral protein like stay within the membrane or like attached to the membrane kind of and not just floating away. So here, um, there's three parts. There's an alpha, beta, and a gamma in this uh, group called a G protein. So those three alpha, beta, and gamma regions, we call the G protein. And right now, this is an inactive G protein. Uh, and we know this because it has um, a GDP here. Now, the purple thing, the membrane protein, is actually uh, a G-linked protein receptor, meaning that it relies on a G protein. So the G protein linked receptor relies on a G protein to relay or pass on the message. So here we go. When a ligand, so in this case, we're using epinephrine, but we're gonna call it a ligand. When the ligand attaches, to the G protein linked receptor. I hope you noticed that the receptor led to, or the attaching led to a conformational change in shape. When that ligand attaches, the protein changes shape. Now that, okay, so here, um, okay. So once the ligand attaches, the receptor protein undergoes a conformational change in shape, which activates that receptor protein. Now, in this case, epinephrine, our ligand, is a first messenger. It cannot cross through the membrane, so we need proteins within the membrane to keep that message going. It's kind of like when you play like telephone, like growing up, that game where you whisper in one person's ear to the next person to the next person. You want to keep that message going, even though the ligand could not go directly into the cell. So here, this G protein actually becomes active from that um, receptor protein. So when this receptor protein changed shape right here, now this change in shape is what is able to activate that G protein. So when the G protein becomes active, a couple things happen. One is that alpha subunit will actually break free and the GDP is replaced with GTP. So now what you have is an active like alpha subunit of that G protein. So if you're an APBI right now, don't stress too much about this, okay? Um, so we're just gonna like ignore the beta and gamma subunits right now and focus on the alpha subunit that is activated. Now there's another message uh, or another protein involved in passing on this message of epinephrine. Now, epinephrine is released during our fight or flight response. It's adrenaline. So we're going to see, like, how does adrenaline attaching to our cell bring about a cell response? Okay. So uh, you also notice once that epinephrine uh, or the ligand is removed or leaves the receptor, 
the receptor returns to its original uh, shape. Now this activated G protein is gonna communicate with another protein. So this protein here is an enzyme and it's called adenylyl cyclase. So the active G protein is gonna diffuse across the membrane and it's going to come in contact with the adenylyl cyclase and it's going to activate adenylyl cyclase. So once the alpha subunit of the active G protein activates adenylyl cyclase, it changes shape um, and is now in active form. So here, adenylyl cyclase's job is to take ATP and convert it into cyclic AMP. So in this case, cyclic AMP is what we call a second messenger. So cyclic AMP actually has like a round-ish shape and that's where the cyclic, like a cycle, <laughs> comes from. So uh, once the alpha subunit from that G protein comes off of adenylyl cyclase. Adenylyl cyclase goes back to its inactive form. And the alpha subunit of the G protein actually has a way to hydrolyze GTP like, and replace it back with GDP. And then it goes back to its inactive form. So here to go back to its inactive form and it can be used again the next time a ligand attaches. Okay. So at this point though, uh, once the alpha subunit of the G protein dissociates from the adenylyl cyclase, the adenylyl cyclase goes back to its inactive form and the G protein will hydrolyze the GTP, returning it back to inactive with GDP. Okay, but now you may be wondering, um, well, we had the original message of that epinephrine, uh, but it hasn't actually brought about a cell response. We haven't seen anything happen yet. All we've done so far is taken that first message, the epinephrine attaching, and we've produced a second messenger. So now there are a series of proteins interacting with each other within the cell. We've produced cyclic AMP, but now we have to connect that to an actual cell response. And this is where we are gonna rely on these things called protein kinases. So cyclic AMP will actually attach to a protein kinase. In this case, it's protein kinase A, and it will activate protein kinase A. But then you're thinking, well, what is a kinase, right? So here, protein kinases are enzymes, because it ends in ACE, and what's gonna happen is a kinase, we have hundreds of different kinds of kinases within our cells. I think I read somewhere that like 2% of our human genes code for kinases. So anyway, a kinase is responsible for like activating proteins. So here you'll see how this kinase will take a phosphate group and will attach it to a protein, making that protein active. So again, kinases basically phosphorylate other molecules to activate them. Okay, so if you want words, protein kinases are enzymes that modify the activity of other proteins or molecules by chemically adding phosphate groups to them. So now, um, again, so phosphorylating another molecule usually means that that other molecule or protein is now active. Now there are some exceptions to this, it's not always the case, but in our discussions here. Uh, when we add a phosphate to a molecule, we are activating that molecule. And a kinase is the enzyme that adds those phosphates. But these proteins don't stay active forever. Uh, we need to also dephosphorylate, and that's where another enzyme called protein phosphatase comes into play. So protein phosphatase will actually remove phosphate groups making the proteins back to inactive. So enzymes called protein phosphatases remove phosphate groups, returning the proteins to their inactive forms. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how we use protein kinases to bring about a cell response. So cyclic AMP activates that first protein kinase A. Now, protein kinase A is a kinase. So as you can imagine, it's gonna undergo a, um, or it's going to transfer phosphate groups and activate other proteins. 
So here it's going to take a phosphate from ATP, which will leave it as ADP and that inorganic phosphate. And it's going to actually phosphorylate the next protein in the cascade, the next protein kinase. So now here, that protein kinase 1 becomes active and will actually go through a conformational change in shape. So if we read back those words, activated uh, protein kinase A will phosphorylate the next kinase in the cascade. We call this a phosphorylation cascade. It's like a waterfall of just phosphorylating proteins within the cell. Cytoplasm. Okay, so then now we have an active protein kinase 1. Now up here, protein kinase A does not stay in its active form. There's a separate enzyme called like <laughs> oh my gosh, phosphodiesterase or something that will actually like take cyclic AMP and turn cyclic AMP into just AMP and that will inactivate protein kinase A. Okay, so now with protein kinase 1 is activated, it'll also change shape, but now it is ready to act to phosphorylate the next protein in the phosphorylation cascade. So here's protein kinase 2. So let's just like move our screen up a little bit. So here, protein kinase 1 will take a phosphate and we'll add it on to protein kinase 2, phosphorylating it, making it active. So now we have another active protein kinase that will take a phosphate off of ATP, etc. Okay, so at this point, this could continue. Right here, I only have pKa protein kinase 1, protein kinase 2, but there could be multiple protein kinases. Um, each transduction pathway is different depending on the original signal, the cell response, the relay proteins involved. Um, but basically, within each cell, this cascade amplifies the signal within. Okay, now if we remember, our original setup was with epinephrine. And epinephrine is the ligand that is, or the hormone that is released in the fight or flight response. So if you get like, I like to hike. So let's pretend a lion, <laughs> I don't know, a mountain lion, like comes at me, right? I'm gonna release epinephrine and activate my fight or flight response. I'm gonna need a whole lot of sugar uh, flowing through my bloodstream to be able to make ATP to either run away from that mountain lion or like defend myself. So that is ultimately our cell response here. So if we remember, like in our liver, for example, we store glycogen, we store sugar. So maybe at the end of this phosphorylation cascade, the cell response is to raise our blood sugar. So now that last kinase in the phosphorylation cascade will turn an inactive enzyme into an active enzyme by phosphorylating it. And now that enzyme will then go, and if you remember, when we break the bonds in a polysaccharide, it's hydrolyzing, it's adding water, and it's breaking those bonds, and now those sugar is, molecules are entering into the bloodstream, raising blood sugar, and that is the cell response from epinephrine, the first messenger, attaching to that protein. So then it activated a second messenger that activated the phosphorylation cascade. That's the signal transduction pathway that brought about the cell response of an increase in blood sugar. Okay, so these protein kinases though do not stay active and the protein phosphatase enzyme will come and dephosphorylate each protein kinase to be able to like reset the pathway so that it can happen again. All right, so that is how in general, like a G protein would work, G protein linked receptor and a phosphorylation cascade. But now I'm gonna look at, we're gonna look at two more kinds of protein receptors, but much more quickly because you already have a lot of the vocabulary. So here, our next kind of receptor is called a receptor tyrosine kinase. Oh man, so here you have a receptor but it's also a kinase. Okay, okay. So when we look at receptor tyrosine kinases, we look at the regions. Here you have the extracellular domain that is outside of the cell. You have the intracellular domain, which is inside the cell. And you have the uh, transmembrane region 
that is in that nonpolar section of the lipid bilayer. So in the top part, in that extracellular domain is where we find the signal ligand, the signal or the ligand binding sites. So here, uh, when a ligand attaches, and for example, insulin attaches to this kind of receptor, a tyrosine kinase. But anyway, so and so do growth factors, etc. So when a ligand attaches to the receptor region in the extracellular domain of it, um, it will actually cause the two like receptors to form a dimer and come together. And now this is an active dimer. Now these are proteins. These are protein receptors. It's kind of a funny shape, but they're still proteins. And these little like grooves on these receptors, these are where you find the amino acid tyrosine. And this is where you get the name, receptor tyrosine kinases. And earlier I talked about how kinases are enzymes that phosphorylate other like molecules, right? They phosphorylate other proteins. But when you attach a phosphate to a protein, it actually attaches quite nicely to tyrosine amino acids. So here, these, this region, this intracellular domain, the intracellular region of this protein receptor bonds really well with phosphate groups. Now, if you remember, these receptors, proteins, are kinases themselves. The name is receptor tyrosine kinase. So what will actually happen is they will actually like auto phosphorylate and they will like kind of like phosphorylate each other and make them like a fully activated phosphorylated dimer. So here, these receptor tyrosine kinases have phosphorylated itself, like each other, to be fully active. So here we have that original molecule that attached. Maybe it was insulin, maybe it was a growth factor, but we yet, we still haven't relayed that message on right? There's still, we haven't even talked about a cell response yet. Um, so that's where on the inside, we rely on relay proteins. There's going to be a series of proteins all within the cell that will pass the message on to bring about a cell response. So here, I just have, oh, another protein, like the message is going to get passed. And we'll talk about more specific examples in the third video, examples of signal transaction pathways. Okay, and that'll bring about a cell response. And finally, our third uh, and last kind of transmembrane receptor protein is called a ligand-gated ion channel. So this ligand-gated ion channel um, is a type of receptor that lines, like you find it between two neurons, it's what's on the second cell, the postsynaptic cell. So here we have the ligand binding site. And this top part, it's kind of like a gate and it's closed. So what happens here is uh, we're going to use the example of a neurotransmitter. So you're going to see a pink circle and that represents a neurotransmitter, which is our ligand, but it's also a local regulator because it's only traveling a short distance through the synapse. So here we go. So a neurotransmitter will come and attach to the ligand binding site. When that neurotransmitter attaches, that gate opens. This is a ligand gated ion channel. So that causes the gate to open and that allows the influx or the flowing in of ions. Now I know we're not learning the nervous system right now, but in the nervous system, that change in ion concentration is what actually brings about a cell response. That, that cell will actually respond to those changes in ion concentration. Now, once that neurotransmitter is removed, whether it's by an enzyme or whatever, that gate will actually close and the ions are blocked from entering. So that, that's probably the easiest of the three uh, receptor proteins. So if you are not an AP Bio, then my video is done. But if you are an AP Bio, I recommend staying for the last slide. So here, if we look at the key points of this video. Um, first, so these are like our standards from College Board, what I was hoping to teach you in this. First is that signal transaction pathways. So basically everything that happened after the ligand attached, 
everything that happened on the inside of the cell is the signal transduction pathway. And it links the reception with a cell response. So we saw epinephrine attaching and the cell response was an increase in blood sugar. Um, we also can see that many signal transduction pathways include protein modifications and phosphorylation cascades. So when they um, become active, they change shape, they phosphorylate other proteins. That's really what transduction pathways are relying on. So signaling, though, begins with the recognition of a ligand by a receptor within a target cell. So the ligand binding a domain, the part where the ligand attaches, recognizes a specific chemical messenger, which can be a peptide, a small chemical, a protein, um, and it's very specific. The receptor is specific to the ligand. So G protein coupled receptors when you see the word coupled, it means they go together. So like a couple is like two people that go together. A G protein coupled receptor is a receptor that relies on a G protein. They go together. Um, are an example of receptor proteins in eukaryotes. So a uh, signaling cascades re relay or like pass on signals from the receptors uh, to the cell targets, often amplifying the incoming signals. I didn't know how to show that in my video very well, but the signal does amplify or get larger within the cell. There's lots of protein kinases becoming activated. Um, and then that results in the appropriate responses by the cell, which could be cell growth. So when the cells divide, go through mitosis, they had to receive a signal first. It could be sending out of molecules or changes in gene expression. Now, after the ligand binds, the intracellular domain, the inside part of the receptor protein, it does change shape, and that starts the signal transduction pathway. Okay, and oftentimes, because that first messenger cannot cross right through the lipid bilayer, these transduction pathways rely on a second messenger. Uh, in my example, it was cyclic AMP, but there are others like IP3 um, is also an example of a second messenger. And they help to like relay or pass on that message to start that phosphorylation cascade or activating other re relay proteins within the cell. And finally, the binding of a ligand to a ligand gated ion channel can cause ion channels to open or close. Okay, so that was a very detailed uh, video, uh, a little bit overwhelming, but that is the basics of signal transduction pathways, uh, linking a cell reception to a cell response. My next video will talk about more examples of cell responses. Okay, great job. Way to stick through it. <laughs>